Tonight what we're going to do is uh, we're just going to look at the book of Romans. We're going to talk about uh, more about the, uh, the introductory part of the book. Okay, uh, Roger, we need some more notes. Uh, how many folks did not get notes? Hold your hand up so I can count. Okay, one, two, three, four, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. You got enough? Okay, keep your hand up. I want everybody to get those. And then, uh, when you come, folks, when you come in next week, there will be an usher at each door, and they'll have those in their hand. They'll make sure you get them so we don't have to go through this, okay? All right. Uh, we're going to be studying, Lord willing, for the next several weeks, the book of Romans. And uh, let me just say right up front that, um, that um, probably, if I had to pick two books in the Bible... And, that's, and I had to choose and just take two books. I guess Romans and Ephesians would be those two books. Uh, they're both doctrinal books. They're foundational books. And um, I don't know what book I would pick uh, uh, that would be of more help than those two books. Now, for those of you taking the, the, the Institute course for credit, uh, you should have received a, also a, a piece of paper Telling, giving you some instructions on how to deal with these notes. How many of you are taking this for credit? Hold up your hand. Did you get the information? You got it. Okay. All right. Uh, that is very serious. Um, you know, um, in this class, there's not a lot of work to do. There's not much to do, but, uh, but it's, uh, it's important that you do it. Uh, see? All right. Brother Newell's gone, but uh, a lot of him rubbed off on me. So you gotta, you got to do the work, okay? Speaking of Brother Newell, he's doing a great job. I just got a lengthy email from him, and he seems to be doing fine there in New Zealand. I hope you'll continue to pray for him. By the way, I didn't intend to do this, but I just got a, uh, a letter t this afternoon from Mitch Muller. He says, we have a prayer request for you. Our rental agreement is up on the 4th of October at our present location. The management has decided not to renew with us as the workers have wanted to use the building for some uh, uh, personal uses, and uh, we have denied them access. Yeah, they bring beer, cigarettes, and all that kind of stuff in, and uh, no, you may not use the building during this week. Uh, we have struggled hard to establish a gospel light in the El Centiro, however you say it, community. Uh, we are the only gospel preaching church in the entire east side of this area. We are located in a community that has a potential of 100,000 to minister to. We stand alone there preaching uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has established a good work here. In six months, we have seen a growth around, uh, from, in our Bible study from our living room of one family to 70 every Sunday morning. We have seen His hand move and bless, and we just cannot believe that His will for us now is to be left without a place to congregate. We trust Him to provide, and we ask you to make this a matter of urgent prayer on our behalf. Uh, will you pray that a place will avail itself for our church uh, here? Thank you, brethren, and so on. What they did is they found an old rundown building, signed a contract, went in and fixed it all up, and at the end of the year they took it away from them. So that's kind of the way things go. That's, but those things happen. So uh, you have to pray for the Mullers in that matter. All right, let's take our Bible and go to the book of Romans. We'll look at chapter 1, and again we're going to talk about... Uh, the introductory uh, uh, part of this great book. This uh, information tonight really is more foundational than uh, expositional. But you can see in verse 1 that the Apostle Paul is the author of this book. So uh, no one debates that. Uh, his name is at the head of all of his epistles. Uh, unless you think he wrote the book of Hebrews, and in that case uh, he hid his name. Uh, the, place, uh, the place from which this book was written was Corinth, and uh, that is evident. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, from the greeting of Gaius here, who lived at Corinth, in chapter, when you get to chapter 16, verse 23, and so on. And uh, so he lists uh, a group of people who were there at Corinth, and I don't know of anyone who questions uh, that the book was written from Corinth. Uh, the time of the writing of the book of Romans was around 58 uh, to 50, or 57 to 58 AD, and it was while Paul was on his third missionary journey. 
Um, you read about that in Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. And it was just prior to his arrival uh, at Jerusalem with this collection that he brought back to these needy saints. If you remember in the Corinthian letter, he talked about, about that offering. Now, the background of this church at Rome, really nothing is revealed in the New Testament about the start of this church at Rome. It's possible that the visitors uh, to Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost following the Lord's ascension were among the 3,000 saved and later took the gospel up to, up to Rome. Uh, that's not an, un, you know, not an uncommon thing because there were people scattered from all over the Roman world, all over the known world, and they were, it says, uh, men uh, from all under heaven were there, if you remember, and uh, the day the Holy Spirit was poured out. And it could be among those uh, dispersed uh, also following Stephen's death, because uh, remember Saul was making habit of the, havoc of the church, and uh, they were, he was compelling uh, Christians to blaspheme the name of Christ, and Stephen was, of course, stoned, and it says there was great persecution against the church, and the believers were scattered, all of them except the apostles, and they were scattered throughout the, uh, the Roman world. You read about that in Acts chapter, uh, chapter 8. Now, we uh, first read of Christians from Rome, uh, and uh, it is possible that uh, Aquila, A-Q-U-I-L-A, and Priscilla, who among, uh, uh, along with the Jews that were expelled from Rome, uh, were found by Paul at Corinth during his second journey. And uh, let's go to Acts chapter 18 and uh, <clears throat> see a little bit about this, Acts 18, and down about verse 1. And uh, you notice that uh, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth, and found, notice he's at Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately came from Italy. So he came, this one came from Rome, probably... Rome, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And it says that because he, that is the Apostle Paul, was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for they were, by their occupation, they were tent makers. So here Paul is on one of his missionary journeys, and one of the ways that he finances his journey is he makes tents. And he hooks up there with, uh, with Aquila and Priscilla, who had been expelled from Rome. So uh, we're just trying to establish something about the background of this church. And we don't have anything definite, but we, have, uh, we know a church was there. And Paul writes to it. And uh, so after traveling with Paul to Ephesus and working with that church there, uh, we find them back at Rome and hosting a church in their house. Look at Acts chapter, uh, well, I think it's Romans chapter 16. Look at the end of Romans chapter 16. Now, we notice that in chapter 18, they were out of, uh, in Acts 18, they were out of Rome. Now, let's go to chapter 16 and verse uh, 3. Notice when he gives the concluding remarks in the book of Romans, he says, uh, I commend unto you Phoebe, down in verse 3. Notice he says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus. So it's obvious, now they're back at Rome. And uh, notice it says, verse 4, who, uh, who, who have for my sake laid down their own necks, and to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. And then... Uh, he talks about some others there that we'll get to later on in the book, okay? And so uh, we can tell then from, uh, this, uh, from the greeting given by Paul in chapter 16, it appears that there were several churches uh, in Rome meeting in various homes. And uh, that was which was not an uncommon thing. They were meeting in houses. And uh, the names of these individuals suggest that the Christians were primarily Gentiles, 
with a similar number of Jews. And so there were Jews and Gentiles in, the, in these Gentile churches. And uh, that is why many times Paul had to write corrective letters to these churches because these converted Jews tried to bring these converted Gentiles back under the law. You understand what I'm getting at here? I was just looking at the, at a, uh, Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew Christian newsletter that I get occasionally, and the question was asked, how should Gentiles uh, worship the Lord? And it's interesting that there are many Jews who believe. I'm talking about converted Jews. They call themselves Messianic Jews. They've accepted Jesus as Messiah. They've got the same philosophy that you find in Galatians and here in these other churches that their philosophy is that Gentiles need to be grafted back into Israel. They take that text in Romans where the, the branches, the wild olive tree, and, and, and grafted back in. They understand that, that we're grafted back into Israel. Nothing could be further from the truth. The tree is not Israel. There's the problem. And the tree is not Judaism. See, we never were broken out of Judaism, and we're not grafted back into it, but there's, here at Rome, uh, at Rome and, and, and Galatia and Antioch and other places, there were both Jews and Gentiles getting converted to Christ. Well, these Gentiles were heathen, you know, they were the heathen, they were in paganism and all kinds of nonsense, and the Jews had the true God, and they had the covenants and had the Bible and had the law and had all of this, so they felt that these Gentiles then ought to start keeping the law and be circumcised and all of those things. And that's why Paul wrote so many of these letters to these Gentile churches to correct these matters. And we'll say more about that, especially as you get further over into the book of Romans when it talks about the weaker brother and all of that. Now, as I said, the reputation of the Christians in Rome it was, uh, was widespread. Uh, both their faith, if you look there at chapter 1 in Romans, look at verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Well, that's the whole known world. And certainly that tells you something about the character of these new believers at Rome, that their faith was the subject of conversation. And what a compliment it would be to a Christian or a church if other people are talking about their faith talking about them, that, you know, those people really believe what they say they believe. Uh, they really practice what they say they believe. And uh, so it was spoken of. And then their obedience, not only their faith, but obedience. It's not enough to just have faith. Uh, our faith is to lead to obedience. And we are to obey the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. All right? So it was well known. And so for this reason, Paul had... Uh, long wanted to see them. He longed to, to go there. And uh, he made uh, several attempts. Look at verse 11. He said, For I long to see you. Now evidently, Paul, uh, it appears that Paul had not seen most of these Christians. Some of them he knew, and he addressed them in the closing remarks of this book. But he said, I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. And uh, he says, down in verse 13, he said, Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I propose to come to you. You see that we can't always do what we want to do. Even the best of God's people can be sidetracked temporarily. You notice he said, Many times I wanted to come to you. Many times I proposed to come to you. But uh, God didn't allow it. Now I would have you, not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I proposed to come to you, but was let hitherto. In other words, I was distracted for some reason. It was not in God's plan or God's will that I would come at that time. And that ought to encourage you, because folks get the idea, if they're in the will of God, that everything will go well, and they can always get what they want and go where they want, and all the doors will be open to them. But that just isn't true. That just isn't true. Um, and there's a reason for it. He said, I was led hither to, verse 13, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. So evidently this delay was for their benefit, even though they didn't know it, and Paul didn't necessarily know it at the time. But sometimes the delay is so that we can mature, or so that God can get some glory and get some fruit uh, from the delay. We don't always know what it is. Most of the time we don't know but we certainly know God knows what he's doing. All right? So you'll notice then that Paul had long wanted to go see them, and, 
And the goal was that sharing mutual edification, verse 11 through 12. This, I think, was the gift he was talking about. And he wanted to be uh, uh, assisted. If you go to chapter 15, he had another reason for wanting to come to see them. Go to chapter 15 in the book of Romans, if you will. And look down about verse 22, 15, 22. He said, for which cause I have been much hindered. Now that's exactly what we said in chapter 1. He said, I wanted to come there, but I was led hither to. And he said, for which cause I have been much hindered, but uh, now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you, these many years, whensoever I take my journey into Spain. Uh, Paul was an ambitious missionary, wasn't he? Uh, he was down in Jerusalem. He was writing from Corinth, and he said, ultimately, I'm going to take the gospel to Spain. Well, he probably had the United States on his target. You never know, you know, had that on his chart. But he said, when I take my journey to Spain, verse 24, I will come to you. I'm going to come through Rome. For I trust to see you on my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. Now, what do you think he means there? That he's going to hitch a ride? That somebody's going to pick him up in a wagon or a boat and take him the rest of the way? What do you think he's talking about? Well, I'll tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about financial support. That's what he's talking about. He says that I might be brought on my way thitherward by you if first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go to Jerusalem to minister unto the saints and so on. So you can see then uh, as Paul... Uh, 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 begins this writing. You see a little bit about the background uh, of, this, um, of this epistle. So we've talked about the uh, author is the Apostle Paul. Uh, we've said the place of the writing, or the, t the place of the writing was from Corinth. And the time of the writing was about 57 to 58 A.D. Just right at the, almost the end there before the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. And we've talked about the background of the church, and we've tried to establish how that the church at Rome got its start. And again, it may be visitors who were converted at Pentecost and went back up and started churches. Um, it's possible it could have been those that were dispersed about the persecution of Paul and, uh, and the uh, martyrdom of Stephen, and they went up there. And, uh, of course, we first read of the Corinthians... Uh, uh, from Rome, uh, we read about Priscilla and Aquila and Priscilla and how Paul hooked up with them and uh, they were tent makers and uh, that way Paul helped support his own, uh, his own efforts. Several churches existed in Rome, it appears. So these were house churches and they were comprised of converted Jews and converted Gentiles. And again, when you read letters to these Gentiles, to the Galatians and to others, uh, you'll understand some of the conflict that was going on and what Paul was trying to correct in those letters. Certainly you see it in the Corinthian epistles, but I believe it shows up in just about all of them. Now, let's talk about the purpose of writing. And you'll notice that Paul expresses in this epistle that he had for some time planned to preach the gospel in Rome. Look at verse chapter 1 of Romans in verse 13. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, same thing he said to the Thessalonians concerning the rapture. He said, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I proposed to come to you but was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you, also even as among other Gentiles. Verse 14, he said, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. So uh, <clears throat> he certainly wanted to go to Rome and there and preach the gospel to them, uh, verses 13 through 15. And then as we said, he would go on to Spain, uh, chapter 15, verse 22 and 24. And uh, so he had these intentions, but... It was the legalism taught by the Judaizers, uh, which uh, certainly were, was disrupted or had disrupted the churches in Antioch and Corinth and Galatia, and certainly was likely to make its way to Rome. So to prevent them, prevent this, he assured 
uh, that his visit to Rome was, was going to be a pleasant one, and he writes uh, to set straight the design and the nature of the gospel. Now, this book, uh, Romans, deals with the gospel. Someone has said the theme of it is the gospel of God. But uh, it is about the gospel. It has the great doctrines of salvation in it. So Paul writes to set straight the design and the nature of the gospel. And in doing so, he demonstrates how the gospel fulfills what is lacking in both heathenism and in Judaism. All right? So this, uh, uh, such an epistle as Romans would uh, arm the church at Rome against those who would pervert the gospel or suggest that it was inadequate in its, or by itself. Now that will make sense to you when you get over into the book of Romans because he labors to show that, that it is not by works lest any man should boast, that works cannot be added to it. And that is really important because most of professing Christianity believes that you must add something to faith in Christ, that faith is not enough. And that's why Spurgeon always referred to grace as free grace. You see, the Catholic Church believes you merit grace. You store up grace. That you do certain things to, uh, to, uh, to have grace, and then if you get enough of it, then you could be saved by grace. But the Bible says, by grace are you saved, uh, by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. So salvation is not by faith plus anything. It's not church membership. It's not water baptism. It's not good works. Uh, it's not the confirmation. It's, it's not faith plus anything. And it's really important we understand that. And that is what Paul talks about as he goes through this book. And he clearly defines the great doctrines of salvation. Did you know Martin Luther got saved reading the book of Romans? Martin Luther was a Roman Catholic monk who loved the Bible, and he loved the church. But when he made the Bible the final authority, a conflict came about, as it always does. You see, even in our churches, there are people who really don't believe the Bible's the final authority, because then they start talking about which Bible? See? And when you start having dual authorities, when you start having dual authorities, you become the final authority. Don't you know that? It always works that way. And so uh, the theme then is found in, uh, in chapter uh, 1, verse 16 and 17. And he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel um, of Christ. For it is the power of God, the gospel is the power of God, unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, verse 17, for therein, that is in the gospel message, is the righteousness of God revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That is the verse that converted Martin Luther. The just shall live by faith. He was going up the stairs at Rome on his knees, kissing each step as he went up. And, of course, he was a man who read the Bible. I think he knew about seven or eight languages. And he was, he was reading the Bible and meditating on it while he was going up the steps. And this verse burned its way into his mind. The just shall live by faith. And he said, I went back to my study like a madman tearing through the Bible, and God began to open it up to him. And he understood that salvation was by grace through faith plus nothing. And here he says the just shall live by faith. And uh, we'll say more about that uh, in the, as we get into uh, the studying the chapter itself. But in those two verses, Paul states his confidence in the gospel because he said, I'm not ashamed of it. And I uh, wonder why he would say that, because you know some people are ashamed of the gospel. They're ashamed to let anybody know they're a Christian. They're ashamed of the content of the gospel, because the gospel doesn't appeal to the intellect. The gospel is foolishness to the intellectual mind, because um, it implies that you can't help yourself. 
You can't save yourself. You're no good. See? And some man had to die in your place. And so you had to have a substitute. And that's just not appealing to a self-righteous individual. A man, you know, we're just incurably self-righteous before we get saved and after we get saved. And before we get saved, we have to get over so we can get saved. And then after we get saved, we have to get over so we can live by faith. See? And uh, so these two verses show that Paul, show Paul's confidence. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, you ought not to be ashamed of what works. Did you know a man who is a salesman and knows that the product works has great boldness in trying to sell it? But it's sure hard to sell something that you're not sold on. Right? I, I remember one time going into a restaurant down at, El, I won't tell you, down at somewhere. And uh, I ordered a, a, a cup of soup. And this lady said to me, the waitress, she said to me, you know, uh, no, I was, gonna, I, I was debating between a bowl and a cup. Here's what she said to me. She says, you know, Pastor, there's really no difference. She said, there's no difference in the amount in the bowl and in the cup. The bowl is small, but it's deep. I mean, the cup. The cup is small, but it's deep. The bowl is bigger, but it's flatter. <laughs> she says, we use the same ladle. You get the same amount. I'm glad her boss didn't hear that, you know. I wondered when did, when did she start working for me. But now I'm, I'm, not, I'm positive that, that most places don't do that. Say. But she was, you know, she was embarrassed to try to sell me a bowl of soup when I'd get the same thing for a cup. And thank God for that. But you know, a lot of folks cannot pass out a gospel tract. They can't witness. They can't get anybody saved because they're ashamed of the gospel. And, but the point is, why would we be ashamed of something that has worked in our life? Amen. You follow me? I mean, if you've had a conversion experience and you've been born again and your life has been changed, you know it, don't you? Well, why would you be ashamed? I mean, you know, sometimes we see people that have been in accidents and they've been in fires and wrecks and, and you know, and uh, we see them for the first time and they're strangers to us and they look horrible. They look hideous. But you know, if that mother got all those scars running into a fire to save their little son or daughter, those scars are beautiful. And that child is not ashamed of that mother anywhere. See? They're not ashamed of them. And uh, so uh, keep in mind then that the Apostle Paul makes it very clear. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, why would he be? You know what happened on the Damascus Road, don't you? Uh, he was smitten to the ground and blinded and led away blind, and by the grace of God, he got his sight and was able and was saved. And he said, I'm not ashamed. And also, you know, it's the power of God. This word power here is dynamos. It's, uh, it's not power like authority that Jesus talks about in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. But the power here is, is, is it's a resident in the gospel. Example, if I were going to shoot you, I wouldn't argue with you about whether I have a gun or not. I wouldn't try to convince you. I'd just shoot you. And the, the shooting would be the proof enough, right? And sometimes we have to try to prop the gospel up. We, we think it doesn't have enough power to do its work. But if we could just get people to preach the gospel and print the gospel and get the gospel out, it has the power in itself to do the work of God. But sometimes we're God's little helpers. You know, we think that it just... It just doesn't have the power to do it. But it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So, as I said, in these two verses, Paul states his confidence in the gospel and the reason for it. And the bulk of his epistle is devoted to explaining why and how the gospel of Christ is God's power to save those who believe. So one of the great benefits of this study is you will be able to understand in detail the gospel and all the parts of it, and what God has done for you. Uh, so, when you get up and you look at the uh, first point I want you to notice here is that, uh, in thinking about this chapter, is that justification is by faith. Justification is by faith. All right? 
And uh, you'll notice in uh, <clears throat> 118, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So you certainly see the need for salvation. The need for salvation. And that need for salvation is first of all laid out for the Gentiles in chapter 1 verses 18 through chapter 2 and verse 20. Now when you read that section you'll see it's talking about Gentiles. And then uh, when you read chapter 2 verse 17 through 3 8 you'll see it's a need for the Jews because the Jews were just in as uh, great of need of salvation as the Gentiles even though they didn't see it and many times wouldn't acknowledge it. And then there is the universal need for salvation uh, in Romans chapter 3. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So he talks about the Gentiles and their need and the Jews and their need. And then he just sums it up and he says everybody needs to be saved, Jew, Gentile, no matter who it is. Justification, uh, sin. We see that sin is the need for salvation. Notice uh, letter B there, justification is by faith. Justification is by faith, the provision made for salvation. And you'll notice that God's righteousness is through faith. God's righteousness is through faith. Go to chapter 3 with me and look at verse 21. 321. But now, that is in the time of his writing, but now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, here's the consolation you can have when you look around at people. There's no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there is no difference. Christ died for everybody. And anybody can get saved for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So God's righteousness, God's righteousness is through faith to the, unbelie to the believer who accepts Christ as his Savior. Now, when we talk about God's righteousness here, we're talking about that his righteousness is imputed to the believer. It's put to your account. And we'll say more about that as we get over into the gospel itself, but you'll notice that Abraham is given as an example. And look at chapter 4. If you've got your notes there, I'm sure you do, number B2, Abraham as an example. And if you look at chapter 4, most of that chapter uses Abraham as an example. What shall we say? Chapter 4, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. So do you realize that if you're justified by works, you can brag, but you'll never be able to stand before God and brag? See? Well, that's what it said. If Abraham, it just very clearly says, for if Abraham were justified by works, he had something to glory about, but not before God, you see. Look at verse 3, for what saith the scripture, Abraham believed God. You see that? And it was counted unto him for righteousness. He believed God. You know what he believed? He didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what he believed? He believed God's promise that his seed would be as the stars of the sky and as the sand by the seashore. That's what it says. That's what he believed. And God counted it to him for righteousness, put it to his account. All right? So justification then is by faith. And the provision made for salvation, God's righteousness, is through faith. And Abraham is used as an example. Now, freedom, then, is the result of salvation. Freedom is the result of salvation. Go to chapter 5 and, uh, 
Actually, uh, all of chapter 5 talks about this freedom. And you'll notice, first of all, it's freedom from the wrath of God. Freedom from the wrath of God. We sang free. Uh, we sang justified. Christians have many things to sing about. And we don't sing in the minor key. See? Because Christians have victory in Christ. And uh, so uh, we, have been, we have been set free uh, from the wrath of God. And um, look down at verse 9. Much more. Much more. It's interesting to look in the book of Romans and look at the words much more. How many times they come up? Much more, much more, much more. It's kind of like when you order ice cream. You know, well, much more, much more, much more. So that's what you got here, verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by His blood. Present tense. Doesn't, notice it doesn't say we're going to be justified. It says we are justified. Uh, verse 10, or verse 9. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. So the Christian is going, not going to have to undergo the wrath of God. He doesn't have to undergo the wrath of God in the tribulation because he doesn't have to go through it. He doesn't have to undergo the wrath of God at the judgment seat of Christ. There is no wrath abiding on the child of God. Christ has taken our wrath. He's taken God's wrath. You understand that? I'd hate to think that I still had to go into the wrath of God. The Bible said it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see? And uh, Christ has taken our wrath, so we, are, we have freedom from wrath. All of that great chapter uh, talks about that. And we, when we get to that chapter, we'll deal with it. We have freedom from sin. Look at chapter 6. We have freedom from sin, not only from the wrath of God, but from sin. Look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Then he goes on to talk about how that uh, we have died with Christ and we've been resurrected with Him and we're married to Him. You see? And verse 10, For in that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, liveth unto God. Verse 11, Likewise, you ought to circle that word likewise because that's the application now. Likewise, reckon you yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof, neither yield yourselves, and so on. So we've been saved not only from the wrath of God, or justified from it, and have freedom, but we have freedom from sin. And then we have freedom from the law. If you go to chapter 7, look at verse chapter 7. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. You see that? But the point is, in God's mind, you, you're dead. You, get, you understand? And the law has no dominion over a dead man. So you have to reckon yourself that you are dead. Because you are. You died with Christ. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live by the, in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you are dead. So you're free from the law. If you die, your bill collectors can never collect. Right? For, not from you. What are they going to do? Come out the cemetery and knock on your tombstones? Not, not going to do any good. Because you're free from the law when you die. And then certainly you're freed, freed from death. Yes, you are. You say, but preacher, I may die, but you can't stay dead. Because death can't hold you. Death has no power to keep you. You understand? You have power over death. You're free from death. I didn't say you're free from dying. I said you're free from death. Death cannot hold his prey. And all of chapter 8 deals with that. When we get to chapter 8, Lord willing, we'll, we'll spend plenty of time on it. So you understand then that, that justification by faith and this provision is made and then we have freedom, which is the result of our salvation. When a man is saved, he's set free. 
He'll state it different ways. He'll say, I feel like a great burden's been lifted from my shoulders. You know? Man, I feel like I'm walking on air. I feel like a new man. There's different ways we say it, but it's because we've been set free. A fellow walks out of jail or out of prison, first thing he does, takes a, oh, what is that? <laughs> That's air. <laughs> See? It's freedom. All right. Now, D, notice the Jew and the Gentile, and we'll notice the scope of salvation. And God chose to save believers. In chapter 9, we'll talk about that when we get there. It's a great chapter. But God chose, and Israel chose to trust in their own righteousness. In chapter 10. That's the problem. Go to chapter 10. Let me show you here, just uh, as we look at verse 1. Show what we're talking about. Look at chapter 10 and verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel, that's the nation of Israel, is that they might be saved. Obviously they were not. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. So if you're trying to establish your own righteousness, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. In fact, you're insulting God. You're saying to God, I don't need your righteousness. I don't want your righteousness. I got my own. And God says, okay, in that case, we'll see how it works out at the judgment. Say, and it won't work out. All right? <clears throat> and then number three, both Jew and Gentile can have salvation through faith. That's all of chapter 11 when we get there. We're still in the introductory remarks of this book. We have not started a chapter study yet. Roman numeral two, the transform transformed life. That's the practical side of uh, the book. And what it does, it ha it's in relation to the overall conduct of the believer, which is typical of Paul's writings. Paul, in most cases, will start out with doctrinal issue, and then he'll move to the practical. You have that thing in Ephesians. You have the first three chapters that deal with our, our position in Christ, and then the last three have to do with our walk in Christ. And you see that in all of his writings. It's always first doctrine and then practice or, or, uh, or behavior. And if you don't get the doctrine straight, you, the behavior will be wrong. And that's why a church has to be both. It has to be a teaching church, but it certainly ought to be a church that practices the things that it learns. You have to put Christianity to practice. Or it's better you don't know anything. Say, all right? Be in relation to civil authority. Chapter 13 talks about uh, government and the responsibility Christians have to obey the law. Say, you asked me about the judge down in Alabama or Georgia. Uh, he was wrong. He was wrong, okay? He was defying the law. The law didn't give him a right to put that there, see? I don't know if you know that or not. I don't know how much news you heard, but bless his heart, he was wrong, see? Now, if the, if the authorities, if the government had put that in there, and then the, 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 somebody tried to remove it, then they ought to scream to high heaven. But you can't take the Ten Commandments down and take them into your work and put them in the foyer and then, then claim uh, religious persecution if somebody tries to take them out. But most Christians don't know that side of that story yet. See? Now, you understand? So I think he made a, I, God bless him, but I think he made a serious mistake. And I think, he, I think he brought some reproach on the cause of Christ because, not because of the, um, the rights of Christians, but because of the, uh, the government never did put that in there anyway. So, so we have to be in authority to, you know, to civil, uh, be in, in uh, uh, subjection to civil authority. You see? Otherwise you have anarchy. And then, in relation to our fellow man, chapter 13 talks about how we ought to behave in relation to God's people, to, to, uh, I mean, to, the, to the people in the world. The next chapter talks about uh, the brethren, but uh, the Bible's very practical on how you ought to behave in, in, in far as your government is concerned, and how you ought to behave as far as people uh, in the community are concerned. And then you'll notice in relation to the weaker brethren, that's chapter 14 and 15, uh, you have rights that you ought not to take. There are things you can do that you ought not to do. You have to consider other people. Uh, and Paul spends a whole chapter talking about that. Um, 
there are things that you have freedom to do that you ought not to do. You ought not to do them. Just because you have freedom doesn't mean you have to do it, you see. And uh, he spends a whole, we'll spend, Lord willing, we'll spend a, an entire chapter on that, all right? Now, in the back part, that last part, you'll notice there's some review questions. And the student, who are, those of you taking this for credit, and I'd recommend all of you do it. I think it'd be a great study for you. The student is expected to answer these review questions by writing in the answers. And they're all found in what we've studied tonight. You can probably do it in 15 or 20 minutes, but it'll refresh it in your mind if you go back over it. And then if you're taking this for credit, of course, you want to bring these notes back next week and turn them in to Brother Roger Crow. And then you will ultimately, you'll get them all back, all right? Okay, I hope that helps you. That's just the beginning. Lord willing, next week we'll get into chapter 1, and we'll actually start studying it verse by verse and going through each part. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your mercy to us. Thank you for the Word of God. I pray that, uh, that we'll be determined, we'll set our course, and we'll be determined to know you by knowing your Word. I pray you'll bless these folks tonight. I pray for our Spanish church. I pray you'll bless them. And then I pray you'll bless the class to follow. And then, Lord, I pray for Brother Murphy. pray you'll encourage and strengthen him. And then for the services Sunday, we ask your guidance and leadership. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. All right, be sure and shake hands with someone. And uh, God bless you. Good night. <coughs> hey, how you doing?